Hey, good morning, everyone. I hope you're, everyone's having a great uh, day this morning on the, on the Monday morning. Sorry about that. The last video actually just cut off uh, by accident. But I'm glad everyone is on here today for this amazing Instagram Live, and I hope everyone, once again, is going to have a blessed day today. And I'm excited because I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit today about um, my book that actually I put out a while back that's been like a huge, huge, huge seller for us. And it's actually called The Universe is at Your Command. Now, <clears throat> within this book, The Universe is at Your Command, let me share one thing with you. This is actually, this book is one of the few books that's, uh, that's like 300 and, I think 312 pages. So you can tell it's a really thick book. Like even holding it, it's a really big, thick, you know, volume of a book. And The Universe is at Your Command is a really good book because most people have been asking me things such as recently in life coaching, um, you know, hey, by any chance, you know, do we, how much power do we have? Do we really have power that God's given us over things? And, and what kind of power does that look like? And, you know, and, and what do I, you know, what, what can I use that power on? So first of all, let me explain this to you guys. We have to begin to come to the realization that we're in a place where we need to question. We're in a season of our lives where we need to question. You know, the Bible says something very plainly when it says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. So what this represents is this. It's okay to ask. And I think most of us come from that place where we just go from, you know, um, pastor to pastor, conference to conference, just whatever anyone says, we just we just buy into it, right? I mean, no matter what someone says, we just sort of like, hey, if he said it, if she said it, because they're popular or they're famous or they're, you know, um, a pastor or whatever, that means it must be true. However, I want you guys to begin to, first of all, begin to bring, to bring your own uh, exploration to your life, which means it's okay for you to begin to explore. It's very healthy for all of us to explore and question things. You know, is this real? Is this right? One of the things I, here's one of the things I do. And before I get into the book, I want to help share something with you because the book is called The Universe is at Your Command. And the subtitle is called Vibrating the Creative Side of God. And the reason why, because a lot of people have been asking me for so, so long, things such as, um, you know, wh how do I align myself with what God says? I remember listening to a podcast yesterday that was really good. And one of the, one of the things that this guy was talking about was he said, you know, we have, to, we have to begin to dive deep into culture. We have to begin to dive deep into, you know, the, the traditions of the day. We have to dive deep into, you know, how those people were thinking. I mean, here's why I say this to you. If God is shedding a broad revelation to a culture from two or three thousands of years ago, and we read it for face value, here's the thing. When you read the Bible— you're going to read it out of your own perspective. Perspective. In other words, you're going to read it out of your own culture. You're going to read it out of the uh, your you know the year of 2021. You're going to read it out of the Americanized Western Western stand, Westernized version because that's how you are. That's what that's who you are. It's you know you're programmed that way. So it's almost it's really hard to come out of a mindset of a culture or a year or a season of our lives because the fact that we're so bound to our our society we're so bound to you know our political system we're so bound to how everything functions and flows around us right we are so conducive to how people respond nowadays you know people back in the day in the Bi in the bible they were very barbaric people most people don't realize this. They were, they were very barbaric people. You know, um, if you took my child, I, I could cut your head off. You know, if you, you know, I mean, people raped women, you know, I mean, severely. And yet the women would be blamed for it. I mean, you know, there's some crazy things going on back then. So you have to begin to realize that not everything you read in the Bible can be applied to you or should be applied to you. And not everything you're in the Bible can you take actual, well, really not anything in the Bible, can you take from a westernized point of view or even from a culture or 2021 point of view. You're talking about thousands of years of progression, thousands of years of evolving. I mean, think about it. We have evolved I mean, tremendous, not just technology. You see, a lot of you look at technology and say, oh, yeah, we've advanced in technology. They didn't even have technology back in the day. That's true. However, you can't look at people and say, and the and you think your progression or the ev evolutionary process of us is merely outwards things such as materialistic things or, you know, we create things better or, you know, or, or even technology because you're dealing with the fact these are actually the non-essentials. These are the things that are not even important. What's important is the mindset of the day, how they thought, you know, how God spoke to them. You know, when people ask me all the time, well, then, you know, um, you know, what, what do I need to do? Here's what I tell them. I say the more we get advanced in science, 
Here's where people miss it. The more we get advanced in science, you have to, you have to, and you should. The Bible even says in, you know, in the council of many, there is wisdom. And the council of many is not just you going and seeing and finding your, you know, us for no more mentality as far as finding your best friends and you guys are talking and you're saying to yourselves, hey, here's my council. These are yes people. Most of your people that you, that, that are surrounding you, unfortunately, will be yes people. We don't, we hate that, but a lot of people that love us doesn't care what we, what you do because they love you, right? They see through your faults and they th see through your difficulties. And so pretty much going to be, most of them are going to begin to agree with you and not realize they're doing it, right? Or, or maybe being a passive aggressive or maybe being constructive criticism, but still get around to praising you because they love you. That's just normal. I mean, people do that, right? So my point being with that is this, is Council of Meaning even deals with the Bible, Everything in your life should be balanced by checking out other things, other resources. There's nothing wrong with that. And the, th and the problem with most people is they tend to feel like, you know, um, the Bible is the only thing I can read. Well, that's great, wonderful, and that can be true for many of you. However, you're being closed-minded. The more you, the more science you read about the, of, of great discoveries, let me put it this way. In science, this is one thing I talk about in this book too, in science, you will never hear the word, excuse me, in the Bible, you'll never hear the word, you know, pro, uh, protons, neutrons, electrons. You'll never hear what an atom is. You'll never hear about, you know, vibration. You'll never hear about frequency. You'll never hear about, you know, uh, planets. I mean, the, uh, the closest thing we read about is, you know, he set the hev heavens into place. Well, that's great and wonderful, but that still doesn't help me out with galaxies and cosmos and, you know, and th that the universe is still evolving and expanding at a great rate every five, you know, every, every millisecond. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us these things. I mean, the Bible even says to the rising of the sun, to the going down of the same. Well, hello, not not Bible. The Bible, does, uh, the, the, the sun doesn't rise. Hello, sun doesn't rise. The earth revolves around the sun. Sun doesn't rise. So do we throw out the Bible? No. We have to begin to interpret it by what we are understanding through science. Because when, because the Bible says the Bible was breathed upon. In other words, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Just like the Holy Spirit inspires me to write my books, just like the Holy Spirit inspires you. Because what that means is it was breathed upon, inspired by these men, and God actually used their perspective and how they viewed society. So it's okay to say that. It's not, not a big deal. Doesn't mean the word of God is not, it's still not perfect and, 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 and you can't, you know, and you can't go to it. You should. You've got to begin to remember though, don't go through to the Bible with a set of closed-minded lenses because you can't. You've got to begin to understand as we evolve and hear things about science, you know, the Bible doesn't even come close to talking about. It doesn't mean they're wrong. And the counts of many means I take the Bible and I take science. And I look and I say, hey, this is not really mentioned in here. Do I throw it out completely? Well, no, that would be idiotic. That'd be really ridiculous for me to do that. So I take science and I say, look at the beautiful discoveries we're realizing. Imagine back in Gal you know, Galileo's day, people were, were literally burned and killed and, and cut, cut to, you know, boiled or whatever. They were killed for saying, hey, we think there might be, you know, we might be floating up in space with planets around us. Oh, blasphemy, blasphemy, kill him. And yet, guess what? People died in vain. It's like the witches. You know, when you hear of you know, the witches of Salem, how many poor women died and, and was tortured and had their fingernails ripped out and burned at the stake out of stupidity because people thought if someone blamed a woman, she must have been, you know, and called her a witch. Cause, cause, in other words, back in the day, even in Salem, if you didn't like a woman, you could say, she does magic. She does witchcraft. I've seen it. You could lie through your teeth, and that woman has nowhere to, no grounds to stand. And she could be burned, and yet, you know what? Nobody said anything. So you have to remember, you have to take... You have to you have to take the sound counsel around you to begin to compare it to know how to begin to understand, you know, the power of what what we're what we're seeing, what we're discovering. Did you know even within the original Aramaic? And let me also correct uh, the 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 standard of theology here, okay? And that is this: the Bible, not this is the Bible, but the Bible was not written in Hebrew. It was not. The original Bible was written in Aramaic. The Old Testament was written in Aramaic, transferred into Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Aramaic, transferred into Greek. So you can't get everything from just by the Greek. In fact, I've told you guys this before. The Greek and Aramaic are like 
apples and oranges. And so they're, in fact, they didn't even want to translate it into the Greek because it would mess up so much. And that's why when you read even, you know, Greek words, you might have six or seven words. People ask me all the time, why, how come when I look at my Greek concordance, why do I have like six or seven words for the word weight? Why do I see six or seven definitions for the word, you know, love or the word, you know, grace or, or any type of word in the Bible? I said, think about it. The reason why you have so many definitions and words in the Greek is because there are are different definitions for words that was translated from the Aramaic to the Greek in the New Testament. So, so, so therefore, and there, and so that alone is letting you know automatically if you've got six or seven definitions. And if you guys don't believe me, look in your own Greek concordance. If you have several different meanings of those words, it's letting you know that we don't know. We really don't know because we could take this one word and we could say it means all these definitions. It's not. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand the concept is you cannot even go by the Greek language. And the Aramaic language is one of the oldest languages in the world, and it's and it's spoken in very few tribes, even to this very day around the world. In fact, it's not even really used except by very few like people around the world that actually tr they're trying their best to hold on to the original form of it. And so that's why I'm saying, you know, if you're going to read it by Hebrew and Greek, you're still going to be messed up a little bit, unfortunately. Hebrew is a little bit closer to the original language, but Greek is way off. So my point being with that is this. When you look at the aspects of um, creation, universe, things like this, did you know that the Aramaic language actually is like a harmonic tone? Most people don't realize this. The original Aramaic language is likened into a harmonic tone, which means there actually are sounds and pitches within the Aramaic language. Most people don't realize that. So when we say today things such as, um, you know, hey, everything's vibrational, everything's of frequencies, and you hear these, God love them, we bless them so much, but we hear these Christians that sort of are feeling like, you know, oh my God, this sounds new age. I want somebody to say, that is so ignorant. Oh my God, that's, we suffer from lack of knowledge. That's so ignorant. Because Aramaic actually was closer to science than Hebrew and Greek was, and people don't realize that. The Aramaic language that the entire Bible is originally written in is closer I'll be honest with you guys, and see, many of you are going to tune me out because you, you don't, you're not willing to hear new things that are historical because you don't understand that the original Aramaic actually lines up more to science today with vibrations, frequency, um, how things happen as far as, as far as drawing and attracting and attraction. Aramaic lines more up to that than Hebrew and Greek ever thought about doing it because Hebrew and Greek language, or especially the Greek, has left that, and that's why they did not want to translate into the Greek originally when they came they came together. And so, I mean, even, even when they came together for the council to put the books of the Bible together in the Bible, they threw out a lot of books, you know, and yet it's okay for us to read those. It doesn't mean they weren't inspired by God. You know, and so you have to understand that God is letting you know that you live, might live in a Western world, but you have to understand the original language is actually, is actually alluding towards vibrations, frequencies, because it has this tone. The Aramaic language has a tone. It, you know, people who understand this, the, the Aramaic will tell you, absolutely, there's like a sound wave. It's like a tone that's, that's sort of harmonic within its own language. And so what that means is this. So therefore, when you read this book, The Universe at Your Command, and by the way, did you know in the Aramaic language, there is very few places of separatism? In the Aramaic language, they don't even use the words us and they, you know, you and me. They don't even use a lot of the words when it deals with separatism. They don't. What they use is more of a oneness sound because they believe everything is connected somehow, even within their own language. So with that being said, when people start talking about all, you know, we're separate, they're separate, we're separate, I want somebody to say, see, you're going by the westernized mentality and you're going by the Greek language. You're trying to separate everything and everybody. When God's like, that's not what I said. You know, and so that's why when Jesus even, you know, um, when, when Jesus was alluding a little bit towards Aramaic, even though that language alone is mind-blowing because when you read it for face value, the original Aramaic, even from what he said on the cross, actually is totally different totally different than even the Greek language. And so my point being with all that is, this is where you have to understand that even like within this book, what I did in the book is I brought this out. The vibrational creation, uh, you know, vi vibrational, vibrating the created side of God, the universe at your command, because there's so many beautiful things about the kingdom of God that would blow your mind. Okay, and so that, these are the things I want you to understand. Let me give you a great example. Now, many of you probably won't, won't many of you, here, here's where I'm going to challenge you and your trigger. If you are religious, if you're religious, you're about to tune me out. 
I'm just gonna be honest with you because I'm gonna share something with you guys don't realize. When you when you read the Bible and it says, and we read in the Old Testament about without a vision, the people perish, okay? Think of that word perishing. I've said this before. When you look at its original, when you, when you look at its original word in the Aramaic, what it means, it literally actually means, it's why you hear me use the words limitation, unlimited a lot, because the original language of perishing means without a vision, you're limited. Without, you know, you put on constraint, in other words, within your life, which means you're limited if you can't see past this now moment. Makes sense, right? Did you know in the original Aramaic language, when it says, John chapter 3, 16, for God said the world, he gave his only begotten son, who, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Many of you, many of you look at that word perish, and, and you, and because because you don't you didn't realize this, you say, Oh, perish, there's hell right there. The original language has nothing to do with that. Nothing at all. In fact, the original language means this. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him should not be limited, but have everlasting life. Because limitation is keeping you from the expandedness of the power of salvation, which is soteria, that's a Greek word for you though, that pulls into the unlimited of, hey, by the way, there's also an afterlife. Hey, by the way, you can be with him in this life and you can, and, that, and that continues for all eternity. So literally when he says, you know, um, should have everlasting life, should not perish, have everlasting life, it doesn't mean perish like, you're, I'm going to kill you, you're going to burn. That's a totally different word. That's a totally different word from the word perishing right now. Totally different. And so what it means is this, you you will be limited without Christ in your life. Doesn't that make sense? Because if the if here's the thing, because here's what it means. If you if 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 that word meant if that one word alone, I'm gonna talk about the other words in the Bible. Okay, we're going on this word. If that one word alone represented perish, that meant meant hell. Then you know what, Jesus, you need to start being clear because you're being very very vague, which is which is really bad. You know, very vague. So you know, here's the thing. If you want me to be bold about a message, you should be bold as well, Jesus, because you missed the mark, and obviously I didn't. Come on. But he didn't miss the mark. What he's letting you know is the truth that when you read that word perish, it means without Christ in your life, you're going to be limited. There's no one to call upon. There's no one that can help you. There's no one that can satisfy the soul. There's no one that can actually walk with you in the cool of the day. Come on. No wonder why it means limited, because what it means is this. I can't walk with you in the cool of the day, even though I'm always with you, because I'll never leave and overtake you, but your paradigm will feel as if you're perishing because there's no one walking with you in the cool of the day. See how much more sense this makes? That's the original language is, 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 is meaning. That's what the original language. So when people turn you off, let me tell you something. What they're doing is they're turned off because they don't want to hear the original language. They'd rather go by their westernized, modern 2021 versions of what their pastor says because here's why. It makes us feel good for someone to be suffering. The human in me says, if you did me wrong, you're going to pay. And God says, wait a minute. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. What are you talking about? And so where you want somebody to be pain, be pain in pain, God says, if I don't outdo someone being in pain, I'm not truly God. So this is new to you guys, but I'm hey, this is this is this is this is what the original language means. So if I say, if let's say for example, let's say Rebecca, Rebecca or Brittany, because you guys, because this is gonna go out to all my other you know, YouTube and LinkedIn, LinkedIn and Facebook and everything else. So I'm, I'm gonna pick up my two this morning who are on my Facebook, my Instagram live, Rebecca or Brittany. So let's say Brittany, you do me wrong. Me and Brittany has made me mad. I am PO'd because Brittany has made me mad. Brittany, you're gonna pay for what you did to me. Okay. God says, wait a minute, hold on. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So if you think that someone should be, someone should should perish or be hurt, Jeremy, because they hurt you. Let me tell you something. If I don't outdo that, I'm not God. So what you want, so what the devil meant for your harm, and let me all say something. What the devil means for your harm, God will turn on for your good. Some of you are your own devil. Hello, I need some help from the choir. Some of you are your are your own devil because what the devil um, this is good. Hear me when I say this. This sounds better bad to say. I'm trying not to say these words, but what the evilness in me, you know, wants to hurt you with. God says he'll turn that around. In other words, God says, because my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, because my thought ha my thought thinks on a higher wavelength of turning it around because I don't want that for anyone. 
but yet you want you want somebody to suffer, Jeremy, but I don't because my ways, my thoughts are higher than the way you think. And if God's thoughts are, if if so, if God tells me I'm gonna, I'm Brittany, you're gonna suffer for what you did to me, and God's like, yeah, that's right, you're not God, and that would scare me. That would scare me to no end if God thinks the way I think. When he says, my ways are high, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And if he turns things around for what, and, for, and actually the Bible doesn't even say the, the devil there. Let me correct myself. The Bible doesn't even say, well, the devil means for harm. That's theology. That's not God. Because the Bible actually doesn't, it says what you, talking about a person that he's pointing to, what you have meant for my harm. So so I, so I let me correct myself. It doesn't even say devil. So when people say, well, the devil meant for my harm, I was about to say, that's not biblical. Because Joseph was pointing out, and so many other people were saying, what you meant for my harm, God turned on for my good. Why? Because the you the you that is humanistic in you, the you that is human that wants to make, some, make somebody suffer out of your jealousy and competition, God is saying, I don't think on that level. Because even, even God Almighty even says this, I will cause, I will, I will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies right there in front of you right there in front of you. And yet God says this, you might want them to perish in the sense of what you don't know what that means. You might want them to pay for what they've done. You might want them to, to hurt. You might want them to suffer, Jeremy, but I'm going to show you how I think opposite. And the reason why I think opposite is because I'm God and you're not, because I don't think the way you do. You want people to suffer. I don't. That's why I'm putting before you a table in the presence of your enemies. And in fact, Jeremy, I'll go even a little further. If you're mad at Brittany because Brittany's made you mad and Brittany's hurt you and blah, 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 blah. I'm going to give you a table before you and her because I don't think the way you do. And not only will I put a table before you and your enemy, I'll even say this to you. You love your enemies. Oh God. No, 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 no. You're asking me for something, God, I can't do. Why, Jeremy? Why can't you love your enemies? Because see, I don't think the way you do, Jeremy. You want people to suffer. I don't. And if I want people to suffer, on your, just like you want them to suffer, I'm not God. And I would literally walk away from God completely. I'm going to be bold and say this. I would walk away from God if God thought the way I thought. How many of you would do the same exact thing? You know why? Because God Almighty doesn't think on that wavelength. He doesn't think the way we do. Come on. I'm just being honest with you guys. So the reason why is because God is letting you know, I'm sort of, I'm still talking about my book, by the way, but God is trying to let you know right here, I think totally different from the way you think, Jeremy. And because I do, I'm shifting you into understanding the word of God is not based on your westernized thinking. It's not based on even your Greek thinking. It is based off of what the original language to me had, which speaks and has a tone that is actually more harmony in the sense of bringing things together and bringing an alignment where the frequency or the, or the vibrating sound of everything in the universe is trying to flow together. My job, and that is why, my friend, the Bible says this, God has given me and you the ministry of reconciliation. So here's what you're saying. You're saying this to me. You're saying God wants us to reconcile, but don't ask God to reconcile because God ain't going to do it. I hate the word you ain't. I'm just saying that's what you're saying to me. So, so here's, so here's where, here's where we're, we're, here's where we're leaving this off. So what you're saying to me is God is double-minded, unstable in all of his ways, because he lets me know that he's given me the ministry to reconcile, but yet God himself doesn't want to reconcile all things, just like the Bible says he would do anyway. Huh. So interesting that God says everything above and below that he will reconcile all things back to himself. God says that. And yet it's given me the ministry of reconciliation, but yet God doesn't want to do it. So, okay, so you're saying you're double-minded, God. You want me to do something that you're not willing to put into motion and practice yourself. Wow. Huh. Very interesting, God. Wow. Unless I think totally different, God, and since you've given me the ministry from you to reconcile all things in my life to bring peace out of, out of, out of the out of the the maybe the hellish ways of my separatism, my separating of you because I don't like you, I separate you, I push you aside. You're mean, you're aggressive. I push you, I push you aside. But yet God's given me the ministry of reconciliation, and He says, Jeremy, no, you draw your enemies close to you. No, I'm preparing a table. No, you love your enemies. But don't ask me to do that, Jeremy, because I'm double-minded. I'll tell you. So, so here's what you're saying God, is, God is, is like. You're saying this. You're saying God is like a parent who says, do what I tell you to do, not what I, not, don't practice what I do. You just do what I tell you to do, but don't ask me to practice what I tell you to do. Interesting how Jesus was an example, a sign. Hello. 
Firstborn among many brethren, so I follow in the same path as him to, to, to reconcile, same path as him to love, same path as him to decrease that he, he himself can increase in me more. Come on. So I'm supposed to decrease to my limitation of how I'm thinking, of how you. I want you to suffer. I want you in pain. I want you in pain. You've done me dirty. You've done me wrong. I'm jealous. I'm competitive. And yet you want me to, to not do that, God, because you said, no, draw people close to you. Love your enemies. Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. Love your... And yet God says, but I'm not going to do it because I'm mad at the world. I don't like the world. That's what many of you are saying. Oh, I'm just mad at the world because you know what? They don't praise me. I'm so upset because they don't praise me. Wah, 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 wah. I'm not being, I'm being serious. I'm being serious. That's what many people think. Many people serve God like God is saying, I'm so mad because that, that person from Taiwan won't worship me. People from India, they won't worship me. I'm so mad I'm going to cry. I'm going to punish them. I'm, I'm so mad at them. But yet tells me, tells me to love my enemies and tells me he's going to prepare a table for my the presence of my enemies and tells me to love my neighbor, even though I don't even know my neighbor, no matter what they are, no matter what they practice. If my neighbor is Buddhist, gay, Muslim, black, white, Asian, be it, you tell me to love my neighbor as I love myself. So there's self-love, loving for people that actually I have no clue what they practice. If they do voodoo in their home or whatever, I'm still commanded to love my neighbor. I don't have to associate with them. That doesn't mean I'm going to join in with them. Hello. But, uh, but yet, love my neighbor, love my enemies, love my family. Okay, so you've told me to practice four things, but yet you don't want you don't want you don't you're not going to do this, God, because you don't you want to make your enemies suffer, um, but you don't want to love your neighbors, God, because they they do something else. Um, hmm, I'm a little confused on this one, Jesus. Wow, huh? Very interesting. I think that's called hypocritical, God. If I'm not mistaken, last time I checked in the Bible, I think it's called hypocritical. Hello, hello. See what I'm saying? Folks, let me tell you something. I'm still talking about my... This is why this book is so powerful. You have to remember, God would never ask you to do something that our amazing, powerful, unlimited God would not do himself because he's already done it. He's already gone before us and prepared a way. Why would, you go, why would he go before us to prepare a way unless he's already done it, done it by been there and done that? Hello, earth to earth, earth to open-minded Christians. <laughs> How many is with me today? I love you guys. I really do. You know, I, I don't sometimes, and once again, I know people are going to twist this around and say, well, what about this scripture? What? The idea is this. The idea is this. The sound counts of everything in the Bible, It this whole sound counts of the Bible works together, okay? So we don't need to cherry pick a scripture out, definitely. But you have to realize God's main thing is that everything vibrates at the sound fre same frequency as him. That's his ultimate plan and goal. That's the beauty of our God. And let me tell you the phileo, which is, comes from the word Philadelphia versus the agape, which is, the, which is unlimited of God's love. Let me tell you the difference. We as humans, we as humans think on a Philadelphia or a phileo love, which means I will love you if you love me back. Brittany, I will love you, but you better feed me back. You better feed love into me. Tell me how wonderful I am, great I am, good looking I am, sweet I am. Oh, I'm just so wonderful. Yeah, then I'll love you back, right? But God says this. God, okay, take a deep breath. So, but God says out of agape, which is unlimited, you love regardless. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what they've done to you. You love regardless. So you're telling me, God, you would actually love people regardless of what they've done to you? Yes, my son. You know why? Because God, because I am agape. I, my love is unlimited, unconditional. And as much as you find yourself in that phileo, Jeremy, where you want to hate and you want to love me, you want, you, want, you, want to love people, you want people to love you if they feed your ego, make you feel so good about yourself. Oh, I just love you to pieces. Why do I love you? Because you love me. That's why I love you. And yet God says, I don't care if they don't love you or not. Let me, let me ask you another question. I got, I, got a, I got a good one for you. I got a really good one for each one of you. So forgiveness. Can we, can we touch on forgiveness for a moment? Forgiveness. Let me see here. We've lined up with love. We've lined up with grace. Let's, 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 touch, let's touch on the subject of forgiveness. Okay, God, let me get this straight. 
forgiveness. So in forgiveness, God, you said, you were approached and says, but Lord, how many times do we forgive? 70 times 7? He's not saying add 70 times 7 up. He means unlimited, like multiple times. The answer, absolutely. You forgive over and over and over again. But I'm God. Don't ask me to forgive anybody over and over again because I don't like that. If you don't feed into me, I'm not going to love you back. Why, why, why? <laughs> I'm not going to forgive you. You, you. you said something bad against me, and I'm God. I'm mad at you. I'm, you. You hurt my feelings. And unfortunately, that's how people think about God. So once again, here's another hypocritical, double-minded God that theology has, has mustered up. And that is, you want me to forgive unlimited God? Everything and everybody? Unlimited? And in fact, let's take this a step. And in fact, you even go on to say in the Bible, God, that if I don't forgive others, how can your Heavenly Father not forgive you? Hmm. Interesting. But So let me get this straight, God. You want me to for, to forgive unlimited, and if I don't forgive, if I don't forgive unlimited every single person, I'm actually up for you not might not forgiving me, but yet you don't forgive everybody else, God. Huh. Let me think about this. Oh, wait a minute. And then you have the religious person who turns around and says this. Well, you know, Jeremy, it's always funny when people say, you know what the Bible says, and you're like, oh boy, here we go again. But yet, Jeremy, you have to remember also, forgiveness is not always for that person, Jeremy. It's a lot of times for you. It's therapy, Jeremy, that when you forgive somebody, even, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold everything. Many of you are going to tune me out. We even want to tell you this. But yet, don't we forgive people even if they haven't asked us to forgive them? Let me get this right, huh? So, okay, so Brittany, here's my guinea pig, my, my, my friend Brittany. In Atlanta, my, my sister from another mister, another mother. Okay, so Brittany, let's pull, let's pull my friend Brittany into this. Brittany, you did me wrong and dirty, and so I shouldn't pout and be upset about it because I should forgive you, right? Because if I don't forgive you, Brittany, then God won't forgive me. Um, but yet they say forgiveness is not about I'm waiting on Brittany to come to ask me, Oh, Jeremy, would you please forgive me for what I've done to you? I'm so sorry, Jeremy. I did not mean a knife in the back. I didn't mean to call you this name. I didn't mean to hurt you this way. I didn't mean to do this. So you're telling me, God, to forgive somebody even if they don't ask me to forgive them. Huh. Let me think about this for a moment, God. So you want me to forgive Brittany if Brittany doesn't ask me to forgive her. Oh, well, wait a minute. Why? Because forgiveness is not actually about her. It's about me. Hmm. Let me get this straight. I forgive Brittany, whether Brittany asked me to forgive her or not. Correct. And we teach that. We preach in the body of Christ. People write books on it. But yet, you're telling me, God. Okay, let, let, let's play the God role for a moment. Can we play God role, role for a minute? Can we do this? Right, I'm going to play the God role for a moment. My son, I want you to forgive all your enemies and all your friends. Forgive anyone. And you never let hold a grudge against them. You forgive them no matter what they've done to you. And really, son, honestly, if they don't even really want your forgiveness, that doesn't matter. You forgive them. But I'm not forgiving anybody that doesn't ask me to forgive them. Because I'm God and I'm pouting and I'm a child. I'm blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to forgive anybody unless they struck, struck my ego. They have to ask me to forgive them. Hmm. Very interesting. So let me get this straight. Oh, wait a minute, God. Wait a minute. You gave, you, you gave the opposite example of what you tell me to do because maybe you believe a little bit more like the way you tell me to be, to forgive others whether they ask me to forgive them or not because I think you did that on the cross. Let me get this right. So on the cross, you actually forgave a man who actually didn't even realize you're the son of God. He basically just threw in a doubt and said, if you are the son of God, huh, wow, remember me in your kingdom. So in other words, you forgave somebody that was doubtful that you were even the son of God, that if by any any crazy chance that maybe you are who you claim to be, if you are this thing, then would you would you actually, you know, take me into the kingdom? Because the truth is, you know, you basically just said, basically the, 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 um, 
the criminal on the cross beside him says, if you're the son of God, you know, hey, you know, if, if that's who you are, can, you know, can I be with you this day in the, in the kingdom? Let me, can, I, can we look that up just for a moment? Because this is getting really juicy. Let's see here. The thief on the cross. Let's get this right here. What did he say? Let me read this for a split moment, because God knows we don't want to disturb our westernized theology, do you? We don't, because we'd rather worship our westernized theology than we would the real God, right, of the scriptures. So let me see here what the what the thief on the cross said. Oh, there we go. Hold on a minute. Let's back up here. Back up, back up, back up, back up. Where are we? Hold on. I'm sorry, God. guys. I'm trying. I'm doing it live. What can I say? So he says, let me see, Luke chapter 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him. Hmm. So let me read this one more time, verse 39 of Luke chapter 23. One of the criminals who were hanging on the cross hurling abuse towards him. So the thief was basically hurling horrible abusive things towards Jesus. But says, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Huh. And the other responded and rebuking him and said, Do not, do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering just, just, uh, just, uh, just, just, justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our crimes, but this man's done nothing wrong. Hey, and then he says this, and he was saying, Jesus, check this out. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Wait a minute, hold on. No, I'm not going to do that. You didn't. You have to know for a fact that I'm the son of God. You're doubting me? Second of all, you didn't ask me to forgive you? No. Third of all, you didn't stroke my ego? No, I'm not forgiving you. Wait a minute. Was Jesus practicing a God bay to love regardless, to forgive regardless, even if they don't ask me to forgive them? Let's read this again, shall we? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our crime. But this man has done nothing. And he says, Jesus, hey, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, truly, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> no way. No way. What about water baptism, Jesus? What about, like, he didn't, he didn't tell you what a rotten sinner he is. He didn't ask you to forget. He didn't ask you to forgive him, and he didn't even. And Lord, he didn't even know who you were. He even said, "If you, if if you are, maybe if you are this guy, can I just be with you? That'd be really cool." Hmm. God, there's so much there that you know. It's funny how nowadays, through Christian nationalism, which I'm totally against, and and some other areas, are speaking so much on religion. Do's and don'ts, but not the agape and the forgiveness of our God in heaven. Hmm, his ways are higher than our ways, our thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Wow, you know what? Wake up call, church. Wake up call. Because one, if you believe this way, then you believe God is totally double-minded, unstable in all of his ways, a child at heart, likes his ego stroked, likes to be told what an amazing person he is. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I love worshiping my Heavenly Father because he is the most amazing God. He is He is El Shaddai. He is, all, he is the God of God. Let me tell you, he is, I love the Savior and I worship him and I love praising him, but not out of an egotistical pride pride because he doesn't have pride and egotistical about him. And he doesn't demand me to worship him because he needs his ego stroked. Come on. You know why? Because agape doesn't mean what Christian nationalism means. Agape doesn't and, and forgiveness doesn't need, doesn't look like what the Western Western uh, theological world believes. Hello, how many of you are, like, are with me? I don't mind challenging each one of you. I could give you guys a lot more on these things that would be like, oh my God, I did not realize what you just said, Jeremy. I've never thought about it that way. I could give you so much more. Maybe in the next future, we will. That's what's important for you to tell your people to stay tuned to the Instagram Live on Monday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. And you know why? Because you know what I'm trying to do? I am trying to make God big. God doesn't need to be big. God is everything. I mean, God is everything. There's nowhere God cannot be, you know? I mean, when people say, well, God is not over here. You know, God's not in clubs. God's not in bars. God is definitely not with that person drinking that vodka. God is definitely not drinking that person at the Mexican restaurant drinking that margarita over here. But yet he says, where much sin abounds, does much grace abound. So, wow, where there's more sin, there's more grace. Huh, wow, that's a big, that's a big one, God. But, but, but no, Lord, let, let, me, let me put my, my dignified shirt on, my guest's dignified shirt on. But no, Lord, 
Those sinners deserve to suffer. Those club-dancing people, they deserve to suffer the lake of fire, Lord. They deserve, oh, sinning like crazy. Yeah, because dancing's a sin, huh? Yeah, right. Oh, they're going to suffer. They're in the club. While I'm, in, while I'm in church, Lord, praise in your name of how good you are. And God says, let me think, where is more grace, with you or with them? No, according to my word, I think grace is actually more with them because they need it more, a little bit more. Because they're, a little, they're a, little bit off, a little bit off the rocker, but there's more grace over here than there are with you. More forgiveness, more grace, more compassion, more love. Hello. What is this thing, God, you're trying to tell me? You want me to reconcile everything, God? Really? By my love, by my grace? And you even tell me to have that you're going to give me peace over those things that I wish people would suffer for, for the wrong they've done towards me, God. And yet you tell me you want to give me peace for the things I don't understand. Why? Because I, my, I'm understanding from a point of limitation because I'm perishing because I believe that if you're not in my club of us for no more, you deserve punishment. And God says, I'm glad I don't think like you, Jeremy. I am totally opposite from the way you think, my son. And praise God, almighty God, that you think differently from me. Hallelujah. I mean that from all the bottom of my heart. Thank you, God, that you do not think like me and you do not think like religious people. If it was up to if it was up religious people, folks, they would be stoned to death. Let me tell you something. I'm gonna say something to you guys that I read this morning that blew my mind. I want you to hear me for a moment. All right? That is this. I was reading an article this morning. I love Carrie Underwood. I'm not a big country music fan at all, but I like Carrie because I knew her pastor and stuff. And but um Carrie actually is um you know she's a dynamic christian loves god more than anything in her entire life and she is not afraid not ashamed of the gospel and this pastor came against her uh, about four years ago for her singing and something christian because she supports gay people and you know and i'm sitting there going hold on a minute so she just happens to like gay people whatever and yet you're gonna throw her out she's, she doesn't practice being gay i mean she's married you know um she's not sleeping with women i mean my goodness you know she's like just supports gay people and you're gonna throw her out of the church um not let her sing because she she happens to think differently from you, and whether you agree or not, who cares? Because let bygones be bygones, and I mean, you know, if we if we got really real and raw with the situation, I don't know any of you. You don't know really any of me. How do I know you guys are not sleeping around? How do I know you guys are not like you know fornicating? How do I know you guys are not smoking weed on the side? Not I mean whatever or getting high? How do I know you guys are not sleeping around? How many not, how many do I how many of you do not know women that you're lusting over your husband your your neighbor's husband because he works out? <laughs> I mean I don't know that from you. So what you're saying to me is, Carrie, keep your opinion to yourself because whatever you just don't tell us, we don't have to know. So in other words, be a little bit more hypocritical. Be a little bit more of what you feel you believe you like. Just don't let us hear it so we won't have to worry about it. But yet, all these other people can believe whatever they want to and love people regardless. And yet, as long as they don't tell me, I'm fine. Folks, do you realize what we've gotten into in the church? Do you realize how... How religious, how pharisaical the church has become? Do you really, do you, have you ever thought about this before? The truth is, there's probably none of us on this feed that believes the same. Who cares? We have one common factor, and that is we are, we are believers in Christ. End of discussion. No matter what somebody else believes or practices, uh, you know, I don't care. It's not my business. Who am I, out of stroking my own ego, here to tell you I am completely right in my theology and my thinking, but yet I have, so therefore I have to tell you you're wrong? Based on what, Jeremy? Based on my own working out my own salvation, fear and trembling, just like they are? See, folks, my main thing with my ministry is I just want everyone just to think. I'm not wanting people to believe like me. All I want is to people to wake up and think. Why don't we just think for ourselves and ask Holy Spirit, what do you want me to believe, Holy Spirit? I don't care if my church doesn't believe this. I don't care if my church doesn't worship like I do. I don't care if my church doesn't do this. What I care about is what you care about, God. I want. I just. I just want to be open minded enough to say, God, you tell me. You tell me what you want because you didn't even tell me to go by the Bible, God. You said I'm led by the Spirit of God. 
And will God and, and, and will the Spirit of God tell me things that will align with the Bible? Sure they will. But not everything's in the Bible. The Bible, I, I used to own a Christian bookstore. Bible never tells me anything about business. Bible never tells me anything about a Christian bookstore. Bible never even tells me that we gotta buy a Bible. A leather bound Bible for $89 with all the with this onion paper and and yet then people turn around and say, Oh, don't sell the word of God, brother. But yet those same people go to the bookstore and pay $90 for a Bible because it's le genuine leather and not leather. What is it? Uh, what is it? Leather? At, what is it? Uh, I, will, I will say plastic, fake leather. I mean, you're thinking to yourself, folks, think, 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 think for yourself, folks. Think for yourself. Don't allow the religious system to tell you what to believe. That's a disgrace and a dishonor to this amazing thing we call the Holy Spirit in your life. It's a dishonor to you having the mind of Christ. Don't do that. Think for yourself. Ask the Lord, Father, I set aside all tradition. I set aside everything this Western church, Westernized church has taught me. Has the church taught, taught us some really good things? Praise God, they have taught us some amazing things. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the faith move and, and the kingdom move and these different things I learned. However, I learned to think for myself too. And God, literally like a magnet, attracted people in my life to say, wow, man, you thought this too? I didn't know you knew this subject too. I didn't know this. If I didn't love every one of you so much, honestly, I wouldn't. Pleather, that's it, pleather. You know, I, if I didn't love you guys so much, I wouldn't even take a, take a step of faith and just say, folks, listen, seriously. You know, you, you owe it to yourself. And the image of God that you're made in, you owe it to yourself to be kind to yourself. You owe it to yourself to love yourself. But you also owe it to yourself to think outside the box of religion. All right, I'm gonna tell you to believe like I do. I don't. I really don't care. That's I really don't. That's so cool with me. I don't. I don't. I don't have a race. Uh, what is it? I don't have a. What is it? A race in the snow. What do you call that? I don't have a fish in the ocean. I don't have a whatever in this race. I don't know. A bet in this race. Whatever. But one thing I do have is the ability to think for myself and the ability to, as a prophet, to ask God, Holy Spirit, show me. Take Western and Eastern out of my mind. Show me what your what the original language means. And you know what? And, and, and I don't have to believe like everybody else. It's okay. When I hear at the end of the year, all prophets are prophets on the same thing. That's what I'm going to tell you. Beware, because the Bible in the Old Testament even tells us: be careful when prophets start saying the same thing and they start pulling out each other's mouths. You better be careful. So God Himself wants diversity. God doesn't want even prophets. His prophets are the same exact thing. Because it steals his from his authenticity. It steals from his cre creativeness. And it steals from your creativity that God's given you out of the image and likeness. All right? So, I love every one of you. And I know I just rambled on for about an hour. But, hey, I love every one of you. If you want to know more about everything I've been speaking on, folks, get this book. I'm not going to lie to you. It will totally go against your sacred cows. But good news for you, I've got tons of scripture, a lot of original language in here, but this is going to do good. The universe at your command, vibrating the creative side of God. So you want to learn? Get the book today. Download the ebook, And please don't let what I just taught you guys go into vain. Don't, 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 don't allow yourself to say, hey, good word, Jeremy. Thank you for that. And walk away. Because I do this because, let's just face it, folks. Hello. I do this because I got to feed my family. And I got to feed our staff. And we need some money, you know, because, you know, money is what causes ministries to flow, to flow and function. So that's why, if you can, hey, just download this for $9.98. No big deal. Or you can buy the book for $15.99. No big deal. But this would help us out a lot. And plus, there's a lot of good information here. Uh, once again, The Universe at Your Command. You can download it as an ebook. You can download it as a uh, paperback. The link is on the on the uh, feed. Thank you so much. I love every one of you. I really do. You guys are amazing. Love every one of you. Talk to you soon. Don't forget, share this Share this if you can on Instagram. Share it. Uh, it's also going to be on Twitter and everything else. Share it on all the other social medias. And, and share it with your friends. Get people involved. Say, hey, get the notifications from Jeremy's Instagram Live. You might not maybe agree with everything he says, but it's give your food for thought, and it'll cause you to think outside the box of, relig of religion. I always say, if iron sharpens iron, folks, we need to be sharpened. And sharpening doesn't mean back up what I believe, Jeremy. That's not sharpening. Sharpening is when I when I present a different angle, different side to you that makes you think, wow, I've never heard that before, to challenge what you believe. That's what love does. Love doesn't teach our children, put your hand on the stove, you're gonna get burnt, you know, burnt. But it's okay. If you want to do it, honey, you can do it. It's okay. 
Love says, you don't need to put your hand on that stove. It's going to hurt like a, like, like a mother. It's going to really hurt, you know? Don't touch the stove, you know? I mean, you know, but you got to be able to sometimes sharpen people and say, hey, I need to think outside the box, or hey, I need to, I need to sharpen my own theology and make sure what I'm, what I'm believing is right, no matter who else believes it around me. If something's popular and you're believing just because it's something's popular, then you need to become Islamic because Islam is, a, is the world's largest religion. And you don't see many of you converting to Islam. Hello. All right? So just because something's popular doesn't make it right. All right? So get the book today. Universe at your command. I love everyone. If you have a blessed day, we'll talk to you soon.